the introduction. Okay, you're good to go. Great. Okay, well, hello everyone and welcome one more time to the Botany and Plant Pathology Fall 2020 Seminar Series. Uh, for those of, of all you that do not know me, uh, my name is Christian Cruz and I will give a few reminders before I, I introduce today's speaker, Mariela Fernandez. So uh, today's session will be recorded and posted online for people who could not attend to this presentation. And second, if you have questions, please pose them on the chat or raise your hand by selecting the participants tab on and select raise hand. It is my pleasure to introduce my student, Mariela Fernandez. Mariela is originally from Costa Rica. She obtained her bachelor's degree in agriculture at the Zamorano Pan American Agricultural School in Honduras. She was uh, later a research intern at Dow AgroSciences, now Corteva. And at Dow Costa Rica, she was first selected as a field science intern. And because she showed passion to exceed commitments with high quality work, she was then offered a research internship at the Indianapolis headquarters where she worked with the crop protection lab. So a little bit of uh, how I met Mariela. So that, that happened back in 2017 at the APS meeting in San Antonio, Texas. And basically a long story short, I accepted, uh, or she actually accepted an, an invitation to spend six months as a visiting scholar in my lab. And in January of 2019, she started her graduate studies at Purdue. Towards the end of the 2018, uh, Mariela traveled to Bolivia where she collected data on the wheat blast path system. And ever since she has been pursuing some questions about this high impact emerging disease. So um, during her tenure at Dow and also with Purdue, she has cultivated a special interest in plant pathology, disease management and crop protection. As you will tell, uh, actually she has done it from various angles, including technology. Her research at Purdue combined plant pathology, classical epidemiology, and machine learning. And today, Mariela is going to be talking about how she ended up combining those areas and how she collaborated with various researchers to achieve her goals. So with that, let's welcome uh, Ingeniera Mariela Fernandez. Mariela, it's good to have you here. Thank you so much, Doctor, for the introduction. And let's see here. Okay. Wheat is the second largest food crop for human consumption, and an emerging disease called wheat blast is threatening the wheat production. This, part, um, this battle can be fought with more uh, efficient and uh, efficient cultivars methods um, are needed in order to try to understand um, cultiv which will be the in order to. This battle can be fought with new resistant cultivars, but more efficient methods are needed. That's why today I will be uh, talking about epidemiological criteria and convolutional neural networks for efficient selection of cultivars against the wheat blast disease. Okay, so today I'm gonna present a, a story that is divided in three. The first uh, section is gonna talk about the uh, general introduction about wheat blast, uh, what is known about wheat blast, some, um, DC, uh, some terms about disease epidemiology and convolutional neural networks. In the second section, I will be talking about epidemiological criteria to support breeding tactics against the emerging high consequence disease with blast. And in the third section, I will be talking about uh, a wheat spike blast, a deep convolutional neural network for image classification in severity levels. Before starting my presentation, um, I need to make I need to notify you that all the experiments that uh, were conducted, all the experiments that I'm going to present, were conducted in Bolivia because Magna Forta or Isotriticum, that is the causal agent of wheat blast, uh, is exotic pathogen from uh, in the U.S. And our lab used wheat blast as a model system for other emerging diseases. So wheat is susceptible to many fungi. Today, I will be focusing on wheat blast. And here in this, in this image, 
we can see uh, that we can see that um, a, a single spike is showing symptoms of with spike blast and it's also is uh, with the spike blast is infecting the lips. This picture here is not a mature field. What you're seeing is a field infected with with a uh, with blast. As you can see here in this part, the leaves are still green. Okay, so with plus, it was first detected in Brazil in 1985 and was gradually spread in different countries in South America. Due to an, um, due to an intended uh, transportation of some uh, infected grain, that went to Bangladesh, uh, there was a disease outbreak in, 20, in 2015. And two months ago, it was first reported in Zambia. The take home message here is that with blast is spreading. Okay, so here uh, I'm showing the phylogenomic tree uh, that shows the relative association of different holes specific of Magna Porta Orisi. The cause of aging of wheat blast is called Magna Porta Orisi pathotype triticum. This image here, you can see the conidia under, uh, under a compound microscope. Okay, but the conidia by itself um, to be able to cause disease will need to have warmer temperatures, also high relative humidity, frequent uh, rainfall, and free water, and also um, a susceptible host to create the disease, to make the infection. Although the most evident uh, symptoms is in the spike, also we can, the disease uh, develops in leaves, at the same time in the brachis, and here in this picture, you can see the sporulation of the fungus. And ultimately, uh, the grain uh, turns out a uh, shrivel and low quality. There is a, com a lack of a complete understanding of the Magna Porta or I say pathotype triticum disease cycle. So hence, uh, the type of epidemic is unknown. But we hypothesize that um, some of the conidias with uh, warm temperatures and with high relative humidity are gonna cause the primary infections and that primary infections are gonna create secondary um, inoculum. That secondary inoculum will cause uh, secondary infections in wheat spikes and leaf plus and uh, later is gonna go to a uh, overseas state. A way to describe, understand, um, compare disease, plant disease epidemics is by using epidemiological growth models. Uh, some of the most um, used models uh, to explain uh, the dynamics of, of the disease are the monomolecular, which are uh, which can describe monocyclic epidemics. These monocyclic epidemics uh, doesn't have um, a secondary infections during a cropping season, and also um, the logistics and the comforts are the models that can describe the polycyclic epidemics. Okay, so. We use models in order to summarize the essential features of epidemics with a small numbers of parameters. Let's see the parameters with this example. In the x-axis, we have time, and in the y-axis, we have a disease severity. And here is the, the, the curve. So one of the one of the parameters that we study is the AUDPC, that is the area under the disease progress curve, which combine multiple observation in order to describe and can help us to, to compare epidemics. 
And something important is that it will give us a single value that can help us to compare, make comparison between different disease progress groups. Also the rate of change. All of us, we are uh, familiarized with this rate of change uh, because of the COVID situation, that is the rate of infection in terms of, of, of this uh, epidemic pandemic. <laughs> and also we have the YMAX, that YMAX is the final disease severity. Okay, so let's, let's recap this. This rate is gonna tell us um, how fast the, the disease is spread. Okay. So this is our first hypothesis that uh, the parameters can be used for selection criteria for wheat glass cultivars. In the second section, I will be talking about this hypothesis. Okay, so the disease epidemics can be classified in according to two types, according to the sporulation of the uh, fungus during the epidemic. Okay, so. Um, we have a, usually the monocyclic disease works first with a primary inoculum. That primary inoculums are gonna cause primary infection and later um, are gonna um, is, um, go to a overseas on a state. The polycyclic disease start similar to the monocyclic with a primary inoculum, primary infections, secondary inoculum and secondary infections. This part, um, is the difference between monocyclic and polycyclic. Uh, these secondary infections can occur, um, can occur many, many times or many cycles um, during a crop season. And later the, the fungus will go to an overseas and state. Okay, uh, so now I'm gonna explain uh, some of the concepts of deep learning. Okay, so many of us knows that Tesla can sell um, our autonomous cars, no? So let me tell you that uh, these type of cars use deep learning technology in order to recognize person, stop sign, and, and among others. So what exactly is deep learning? So deep learning is, is inspired in how the neurons communicate um, each other and their neural connections. connections. And they are famous because of the ability to extract automatically important features from data. I will be focusing on deep convolutional neural networks models, which are the most successful deep learning um, models for image classification. Okay, so how deep convolutional neural networks works. First, we collect labels um, with, uh, and we collect images and we label that images. Um, there are many available uh, data set that are huge that has thousands of, of images. Okay, so later what we do is we fit all of that uh, images into the uh, network or into the architecture, into the model. So the model will have different layers. In the hidden layers, uh, the first uh, layers are gonna detect patterns from the images. Um, later, uh, we'll extract some features. And at the end, the layers that are at the end will recognize higher, uh, higher features, um, like for example, here faces. And at the end, uh, the model will, uh, now that you learn that faces, will make a prediction and will classify um, the image. So um, our hypothesis, uh, our hypothesis, our second hypothesis that I'm gonna talk about uh, of this in the third uh, section is that deep convolutional neural networks models can be trained with, uh, with, with spike class images uh, severity for uh, image classification and also for pristine or cultivar resistant under control environment. So that is the basic idea of how they work. Okay, so why my research is important? Because with glasses and emerging disease, a high consequent disease that is spreading worldwide and is treating the global uh, food production, global wheat production. 
there is a lack of epidemic understanding, epidemiological uh, understanding of the pato system. We don't know exactly what type of epidemic is, or we don't know which is the, the rate of the disease, no? Um, and the rate of the disease progress will help us uh, to make management decisions in the future. Okay, so um, also limited genetic resistance exists. Right now, there is just a, a available, a partial resistance um, that is uh, to an estrogen's location. Um, um, and that's why we need to um, make more screening, screening in order to try to identify more resistant genes. And this process is labor consuming, and it's, it's, it's like, um, it take a lot of resources, take a lot of time, and sometimes the evaluations are not um, are not that that reliable. So um, the aim of the work of our work well, is first develop epidemiological knowledge and tools um, based on with um, on image sensing and deep learning for efficient cultivar selection. These two aims uh, both are directing to support uh, breeders when making decisions for uh, cultivar resistance against wheat blast. Okay, so now let's move on. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna focus on how epidemiological criteria can help us to understand with blast epidemics and how this knowledge um, can help breeders when making decisions about cultivar selection. If you're more interested on this research, you can go to plant disease. Okay, so the research ob objectives of this, um, of, of this chapter, of this section, session is uh, first to assess 10 spring wheat cultivar for wheat blast resistant using epidemiological parameters. And the second objective was to evaluate the temporal dynamics of wheat leaf blast and wheat spike blast in multiple environments. Okay, so uh, the experiment were carried out at two locations in Bolivia during the growing season. Uh, the, uh, the two experiments were established, established um, in each location for a total of environment of four, for a total of four environments. So uh, in both experiments, the experimental design was a randomized complete block uh, with four reps, four reps and 10 cultivars with different origin. Uh, some cultivars were from Bolivia and other, others were from Brazil. Okay, so the experiment one uh, was characterized because uh, um, was uh, the spreader or the source of inoculum, the source of the fungus, um, was surrounding the experiment. In the second experiment, um, the experiment was surrounded by Urubo, which is a resistant cultivar to wheat blast. And the particular, uh, per, the particular um, of this experiment was that it was surrounded by the spreader or the inoculum, the fungus, um, of MLT in each experimental unit. Okay, so how we collect data? We collect, oh. <laughs> okay, so we have, we collect data from uh, 10 cultivars with different responses to with a spike blast. As we can see here, Atlax here uh, is with, um, is, is, uh, this is showing the Atlax that is a susceptible cultivar. And later we have here Urubo that is a resistant cultivars. You can notice from these pictures uh, that uh, the susceptible cultivars is uh, showing like, um, like bleach spikes and here uh, is completely green. Okay, so how we collect data? So 15 plants uh, per experimental unit were visually assessed for disease severity uh, percentage. So what we did, uh, here was we calculate the, we estimate the disease area in a spike or an, in, the, in a spike 
and also in all the leaf organs, all the way around. At the end of the season, uh, all experimental uh, units were harvested and the grain uh, and hundred and hundred seeds of of each experimental unit was weighted for futures analysis. Okay, so we first generated a disease progress curve and then we calculate the area under the disease progress curve of spikes and leaf and later we feed um, the growth models and we correlate the different epidemiological parameters and rain weight. Okay, so here, um, I know that it's a lot, but um, I'm just showing this because there are four environments, uh, there are four environments, two locations. Um, so the thing is that uh, what we're seeing here is that is the disease progress curve, uh, that this provide us a way to, a way to compare the disease across location. So here in the X axis, uh, we have, the day after emergency of the plants. And in the uh, y-axis, we have the, sever the severity percentage. Clearly, this, um, the disease progress curve of these 10 cultivars occur at different level of severity in the two locations and in the two experiments. So for the sake of time, um, I will explain just the experimental the experiment two in both locations. Okay, so as I told you in the introduction, uh, the disease progress curve allows us to extract parameters um, in order to make comparison. So here we're just observing the curves. And, and here we can show that evidently there are three types of groups um, um, of responses to with blast. Here in the here we have the susceptible. Here we have the moderate resistant, moderate susceptible, and the resistant cultivars. The bottom line of this is that uh, there were differences between disease progress curve. So with this data, um, we can move on to our next uh, explanation, next analysis. Okay, so in the x-axis, we have uh, the 10 cultivars and in the y-axis, we have the area under, under the curve, under the disease progress curve. Um, in orange, we have, a, we have leaf blast AUDPC and in brown, we have a spike blast AUDPC. The majority of the studies of wheat blast has been focusing on the spike, but here we can see clearly that there is an there is an evidence um, that with a spike uh, with leaf blast uh, can also affect the severity. So the question here uh, that I am bringing is: Are the breeders consider with leaf blast and the environment when making uh, decisions about cultivar selection? Okay. So let's remember what we, that we use the population growth model uh, to characterize the epidemics. So here, what we, what we did was we fit four uh, population uh, models. We fit the monomolecular, the logistic, the gumpers, and the exponential models. Here in this table, in this big table, I'm just showing the results of the best uh, population growth model that best describe the 10 cultivars. Okay, so um, the main important information about this is that we, that we found out that 10, 34 cultivars were characterized by the logistic uh, the, the logistic can characterize 34 cultivars and six cultivars were characterized uh, by the Gompertz model. Another important thing from here 
is that we were from from here we are able to get the rate of the of of change of the disease so the bottom line here is that the logistic uh, model are and um, the compress models both are pointing out to a polycyclic epidemic and the rate of change was obtained from here okay so uh, this table represents the effect of each cultivar according to the different epidemiological parameters. So, yeah, I know that it's a big table, but here I'm going to simplify this information with just showing in red uh, the susceptible cultivars. As we can see, the susceptible cultivars um, presented a higher AUDPC, a higher rate of change, and, uh, and the highest um, disease, final disease severity, and the lowest grain weight. Here in blue, um, the blue uh, is highlighting the resistant cultivars, which show it the lowest AUDPC, the lowest rate of change, the lowest final disease severity, and the highest uh, grain weight. So there were ex differences existed in, term, in parameters between susceptibles and the system cultivars. So now that we found that there were difference, what we did was, was correlate these parameters. So all of the parameters were significant correlated among them at, at both location and in, in all the experiments. So the significance of this analysis is that we can use any of these uh, criteria for cultivar selection. The breeder can determine if uh, which criteria uh, we want to use or he will want to use, he or she will want to use um, in order to make decisions about cultivars. Something that he will consider is that um, if they want to use the AUDPC or the rate of change, uh, we'll need to have multiple evaluations during the, during the, um, during the crop season. And one max uh, is a single evaluation point. So just one evaluation, one point in, during the season. Okay, so we conclude that epidemiological parameters such as um, AUDPC, the rate of change, and wine mass could be used to help uh, pathologists and breeders to make decisions about with blast uh, cultivars resistance. <laughs> and later, uh, we, we, we at the same time, we saw that uh, the logistic model that described the disease progress of wheat blast pointing out to a polycyclic type of pathogen. Later, we provide uh, evidence that um, different backgrounds of cultivars uh, can in be influenced by wheat leaf blast and wheat spike blast under multiple environments. Okay, so some of the limitation was that we just that tested um, 10 spring cultivars and it was just in one country. Uh, the weather data was not included as part of the analysis. And some of the future directions is that uh, maybe we can, we can include uh, some specific, uh, some desired traits that the breeder will like to include. And also a better genotype environment interaction studies needs to be conducted. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the deep learning model uh, for image, uh, for with spike blast image classification. Uh, now it's uh, under review in the Journal of Computers and Electronics in Agriculture. Okay, so the three objectives of this research was first, analyze, um, analyze, uh, generate a with spike blast image library labeled with disease severity. The second was to analyze the agreement of disease severity model training sets 
between two experts uh, in plant pathology and an image uh, analyze uh, and an image software analyst. So, and the third one was to develop an accurate deep convolutional neural network model able to detect and classify with a spike glass symptoms in three, in three severity categories under control environment. Okay, so to train the with the spike glass a deep learning model, we started with the plant cultivation. Later, subsequently, we inoculate the, the spikes, we collect data, the data collect, collected here were, was a image, were images and also visual evaluations. And later, we divided the data collection into these categories. Um, we needed to prepare the data before, uh, before uh, doing the model. And also we analyze the integrator agreement of the visual evaluations of the images. And later we were able to do the deep learning model. So that is the pipeline of the model creation. Okay, so six cultivars with different level of resistance to with the spike glass were growing in a, were grown, growing in a growth room in Bolivia with temperatures in between 18 to 25 Celsius and 60% relative humidity and 14 hours light. Okay, so when the spike was fully merging, uh, we inoculate the spike with one ml of inoculum with a concentration of 20,000 um, spores. So after we inoculate these spikes, we move them into a humid chamber. That humid chamber, uh, humid chamber has um, relative humidity uh, more than 95%. So after that two days uh, passing and the spikes were um, and the disease was uh, in infecting the spikes. Later, we uh, collect images and also visual evaluations. The way that we collect the images were in each spike, we collect um, the four phases of the spike. At the end, we we got a uh, total images of 3,306 images. Okay. So that total images, what we did, well, what I did was um, I, di I divided uh, the total data set into three categories. The three categories um, that we have here. Okay, so the criteria for this division was based on literature review that shows that around 20% of this is severity, uh, the cultivar is considered uh, resistant. So here we have the category number one that was the, the, the category that included images of healthy spikes. Later we have the category number two that show us uh, from 0 0.1 to 20 disease severity, and um, it shows some low levels of disease. And later in the third category, we have uh, we have a, from 20.1 to 100% disease severity. Okay. So the, the total data set was divided into 80% training and 20% testing. This was, a, this was the initial distribution of the images per category. Okay, so when, I, when we were observing uh, the images, we find out that some of the images presented symptoms, but uh, I was not sure about if these spikes were maturing or the symptom was because of weed blast. So because of that, we decided to make two training sets. One, the first training set, uh, that is the data set one, was um, included maturing 
and non-mature spikes. The data set tool just included a mature spikes, non-mature spikes, non-mature, okay? So, no, no mature. <laughs> um, okay, so because the distribution of the images uh, were not similar, we, we went to, uh, we use a technique that is called data augmentation. So data augmentation is just making copies of our original image from a category. So here you can see the data augmentation. So for example, here in category two, we make copies of an image three times. Okay, so once we have uh, the two data set already, uh, we needed to analyze the integrator agreement of the visual estimation uh, of, both of both training sets. This analysis assess the degree of agreement or how close uh, to how uh, the degrees of, of agreement or closeness between two or more raters when making an evaluation of an object, in this case, the images. Okay, so the disease severity estimations of rater one, I was rating one, I was the one that estimated um, the disease uh, severity of all the training sets. So, um, of both data sets, and we compare my evaluation with a, an expert in with an expert in with plus, and later we we measured the disease area of the severity using the threshold uh, of of image image J that is an image processing analysis. Okay. So once we had that data, what we did was analyze the, the integrator agreement of, of these evaluations and these measurements. Okay, so one of the one of the analyses that we run was a weighted cohen kappa, uh, the place kappa and the link concordance. Because of the sake of time, I'm just going to focus on the weighted cohen kappa. Oh, something important is. The thing is that uh, if the agreement is high, we can train an accurate model based on accurate levels. Labels. Okay, so for training the model, we decided uh, to use a common technique that is uh, of deep convolutional neural networks that is called transfer learning, which consists in just borrowing a model uh, that was training in one that was training one million of images with more than 20, 22,000 of categories called ResNet. So this pre-trained model was used and the only thing that we changed was uh, the last layer and we added uh, three nodes that will represent the three categories of the uh, spike um, of, of the spike with spike class. Okay, so the way that it learned. So we have this image, we uh, introduce, the, we feed the model or we pass the, the image to, through the model. The first layers, we're going to uh, learn some of the patterns, later some of the features, and later are going to have like a better idea of what is the, the images. And later we'll make a, we'll make a, a, a prediction of which category this image will go. Okay, so because, because we have unbalanced data, so what we did, yeah, an approach that we did was we put emphasis in the learning. For example, I'm gonna make an example. We make an emphasis in the learning of the category number two. Um, later, we emphasize the learning of the category number, number one and number two. Okay, so uh, in order to know if I perform the good estimation of the disease severity, we compare my evaluations uh, that I was very in one with um, an expert in with glass, as you can see. So in general, the general idea was uh, that we obtain good indices when comparing me with greater one and also image J. Here, I'm showing that I, I had almost perfect agreement with uh, image J. Okay, this is a big table. 
uh, that is presenting just the cases or the, the performance overall of, of the model, of the classification model. So uh, what we found out was that the model uh, had uh, presented better performance when classifying the data set two. The data set two was the one that has higher agreement and was in, with images that were, were not mature. Mature. Okay, but because of the sake of time, I'm just going to focus in the case number three. Okay, so there are three important indices for evaluate image classification performance of the deep convolutional neural networks models. So which are precision, recall, and the F1. Okay, so precision refers to the percentage of the positive predicted uh, images by the model. When recall refers to the percentage of total images corrected classified by our model. And the F1 score, um, will summarize both precision and recall. Here, what we found was the model was, a, was a more accurate or was classifying, was consistent when dividing, when making the decision or making a deprotection of the images of category number three. So um, that will help us, that will help the breeder in a future in order to not emphasize, in, in not in not uh, use these these images of this category uh, for the field, we can use this model as a, as a pre selection or pre screen. Okay, and also um, the the model has more challenge um, when classifying the images of category number two, and um, and this is something that is common because. Sometimes the lesions are of, of 0 0.1 to, to 20. So, well, initially the, the first ones are a kind of really small that sometimes we as humans also miss. Okay, so in general, the general conclusion of this is that uh, we generated uh, the with a spike glass image library labeled with accurate and with high agreement. Um, this is a rate estimation. And we develop a deep convolutional neural networks able to classify, able to detect and classify the with a spike blast symptoms in three severity categories under control environments, which can be a pre screen. Can serve as a pre screen. Okay, some of the limitations was that the model uh, is limited to control conditions. Also, that uh, the model was training just to classify three categories. And some of the future directions uh, is that we use uh, some of the future directions can be used more isolates um, and more, more cultivars in order to have more variability of symptoms. And also uh, deploy, deploy models in a web app. Okay, so I, uh, the take home message of my research is that according to this study, uh, we can select uh, we can select cultivar by taking multiple evaluations or single evaluation of disease like the Y max that will make more efficient the cultivar selection. And also, we can use the with a spike glass uh, deep learning model in order to use it as a pre-screening on the control environment to better efficiency. When I say this efficiency, um, number one can be that um, know the advance of levels that will happen under the field conditions, no? And later also uh, may reduce the high number of cultivars tested in the field due to the pre-selection the pre uh, process. Uh, we can reduce the subjectivity of the visual estimations. And, and now I just want to acknowledge, I want to take, thank you, thanks Dr. Cruz, um, my PI, for all his support. And also I want to uh, thank uh, Carlo, Dr. 
Dr. Gongora for being a mentor and all the Cruz Lab, all the visiting scholars that, have, that has passed through our lab. Also, Dr. Dr. Jahan Shahi and Yutin helping me with the development of the model. And, and my Bolivia uh, group uh, that received me like part of their family. And uh, I want to thank my mom and all my family, mentors, friends, and Brendan. Uh, besides that, I also want to thank all my um, associations, all the associations that I have been involved. And um, I want to thank also my committee members, who, who is Dr. Christian Cruz, Darcy Tolenko, uh, Dr. Mohamed Jahan Shahi, and Bob Nielsen for helping me to have uh, uh, to have this this research showing uh, to you. Thank you so much for everything, and thank you so much for your attention. And I would love to take questions. Thank you very much, Mariela. Round of applause from here. Okay, so we have one question. Actually, I, I remind um, more people to send their questions via chat, or if uh, you're brave enough, please uh, uh, unmute your mic and uh, go ahead and, and ask your question. So we have a question from Dr. Emil Lynch. And uh, so he said, nice presentation. How good do you think this imaging tech might get at assessing disease severity early during infection and predicting future severity? Could it actually improve on an expert eye? Okay, you hear the question? So that one is in the chat? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. Okay, so during early infection, during the uh, yeah, so some of the some of the results that we have was that our model was challenged um, to was kind of challenged when making a prediction of that of the category number two that was lower infections uh, but uh, it was we have like a point like a 80 88 percent performance 88 percent of prediction that, that that the model can predict correctly 88 percent of all the the images so it will actually improve on i expert expert i Okay, well, that, that can accelerate also the process. And besides that, um, we saw that the agreement of our, our model uh, was good. And sometimes when readers or when we did visual evaluations or not just readers, pathologists in general, we do visual evaluations. Uh, sometimes if we have thousands of cultivars, um, we tended to be tired at one time and we try to be, we can be like, uh, having like misleading results. So that will be my my answer. Very good. And and just to add a little bit on, on Mariela's answer. So basically we, we were looking at uh, RGB images. And so when, when we think about mm -hmm. how early we can detect a disease symptom, uh, it really depends on the technology that you're using. So in this case, so we're looking at the visual spectrum and uh, it will be actually very challenging for this particular model to detect something that is not visible for the human eye, right? And so we can always improve, but uh, definitely we will need uh, a, a different type of sensor in order to make better detection and predictions. Okay, so Dr. Talenko is asking, what about distinguishing between other diseases? For example, scab would have similar symptoms. Yes. So with this question, um, like perfectly, we can use our model, um, but uh, for, for, we can use our model, but the thing that uh, we will need is images, more images of with, with plus, uh, of, with, of Fusarium head blight, and we will need to label the, the images, and we can uh, train it uh, with uh, our model, in order to make the differentiation. But for now, the model that I have, uh, I, on, I only change, will be, only will be um, able to classify with a spike blast severity. 
So I will need to do another model for that or just add another node. Mm -hmm. Correct, very good. And so also remember that the technology was developed for control environments, uh -huh. uh, but include inoculations, right? So, okay, Dr. Steiger is asking, how often do foliar symptoms precede the head blast? Mm -hmm. And is there a way to combine analysis of leaf image data with tassel or head images to get better sense of disease progression? Yeah, so um, that's why I'm gonna stay with Dr. Cruz uh, working for at, at least like two semester more because we have tons of, like, of data and some of the data that we have is for a, uh, of in some some images that we have is in, you know, with the blast. So that is one of the things that we we want to try to make a model in order to detect also the the leaf blast. And 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 yeah, I think that I think that yes, yes, we can we can study that and also we can um, we can study the the vertical the vertical movement of of these pores, no, and try to see if we can we can link this information. Very good. Mm -hmm. so we have another question from Anna Conrad. Uh, what platform software did you use for building your DCNN? Are okay. there opportunities to use transfer learning to expand the model to different environments? Yeah, Anna, thank you so much for your question. Um, well, uh, I didn't develop the model, so we did a collaboration here that was Jutin. Uh, Jutin is a student, a grad student in Dr. Jahan Shahi Labs. Um, she implemented the, the model in PyTorch. So she used PyTorch. Um, there are opportunities to use transfer learning uh, to different environments. So. That is another thing that we have. We have some um, data, some some images of with the spike glass and with the glass at field conditions that um, we we are gonna try to work on that in order to have a, a model that can be classified images at field conditions, no? Okay. Important. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so uh, so Thank we don't have- so for the questions. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have more questions. Oh, we have one here. So great presentation from Janine. Without uh, G by E interaction, so genotype by, by environment interaction considerations in your outcomes, were there any adjustments made to your model to account for potential differences? Outcomes, were there any adjustments made to your model? Account. Can you uh, can you uh, explain more your question, please? Sure, uh, Mariella. Hi, great station. We're so proud. Yeah, um, I was just wanting to ask, like, when we were looking at a breeding equation, genetics, of course, is a huge part of it, and then the environmental interaction with the plants are a whole nother dynamic that ultimately affect the phenotype. And then when you're looking at pathology, that has to be taken into account. So I was just curious, did you make any adjustments in your model because environment wasn't considered when we look at um, the amount of rainfall, the heat and all? Yeah, okay, now, now I understand. Yeah, so the thing is that, um, well, because the objectives of the study was just to study like the, the temporal dynamics of these, um, of these cultivars, we didn't count. Uh, we didn't take account. We didn't make analysis of the of the of the raining of the environmental conditions. So that is something that uh, I I included as a future um, future in, um, future research uh, questions that need to be uh, answers. Yeah. Very good. And also, to, just to add up to that comment, uh, so usually when we look at, at epidemics, we are uh, interested, and actually, so this is, has been the traditional way on how epidemiologists would, would use the data. So you can perfectly use the, the information coming from the symptomatology alone to make inferences. And so that's what, what we did in this case. Of course, it's always important to, 
consider all, all their uh, important factors in the disease triangle. But so we were limited. Actually, we ended up losing some some sensors in Bolivia. So it's, it's challenging, but uh, I think the the results that, that Marilla obtained were, were very promising. Yeah. So great for great question. Okay. So let's see. I think that's the last question uh, that uh, the public sent. I, I would I would ask another final question. So, uh, why Bolivia? Why not the U.S.? Why did you conduct your studies in Bolivia, or let's say why not Brazil? Okay, so mainly, uh, mainly was because. Um, there is a group of studies, uh, there is a collaboration with Kansas State University and other universities uh, that are working on to study with plus in Bolivia. And mainly was because uh, they have like a, a program in order, they have an apple, they have, that is an institution uh, that works in order to have uh, some cultivars the season to wheat plus and also uh, we have um, the SIAC that there is another institution that um, is make research in order to answer questions of the of, of, of the of the people in the field so mainly it was because we we had that collaboration and because it's a, it's a country that produces a lot of, of wheat and the, the, the disease outbreaks that they, will, they have had uh, has been highly affecting. And uh, one of these implications of, of this is because uh, is one consequence of this is that many farmers have decided to not uh, plant wheat. In, in many start planting other type of crops. Very good. And I think Carlos has also either a question or a comment. So Carlos, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. It, uh, Marilla, it was a, a good, a good uh, presentation and it was very clear. So it, it uh, very, very nice. So I just want to add a little, uh, a little comment related to the uh, the previous question about uh, uh, the interaction between genotype and environment. So, uh, of course, uh, we are not breeders, uh, uh, but let me uh, in the in the in the model because we did the repeated measurement analysis. So we considered during the analysis, uh, uh, I think the interaction of cultivar and uh, an experiment or environment even with time we're considering the overall ANOVA. And uh, if you see the, as Marilla told, if you consult the, the paper in, in plant disease, uh, there was there was an uh, interaction. So we didn't discuss too much about the effect of interaction, it was not the main goal, but uh, I can tell you according to the pay, published paper, uh, there, there was an uh, interactive effect more than a additive effect. So, I mean, the, the goal here is that environments uh, where uh, each, each cultivar has a different uh, behavior in the environment. So it was considered in the model, I think Mariela did in the, in the repeated measurement analysis. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Well, it's 3 p.m. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Mariela, for a great presentation. So we're gonna proceed with uh, your defense. So I have sent, I have sent uh, another Zoom link for the committee members so we can uh, get connected and start the discussion. Okay, well, thanks Thank again. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Bye.